National Geographic's Welcome to Earth, starring Will Smith, is a new six-part original series coming to Disney Plus December 8th. Smith embarks on a once-in-a-lifetime adventure across the globe alongside some of the world's top explorers. Take a ride through Earth's mind-bending portals and observe the strangest, most unusual spectacles the planet has to offer. Some captured for the first time ever. You've never seen the world like this. National Geographic's Welcome to Earth. All episodes streaming December 8th, only on Disney+. Plus. At Capella University, education is as smart as the world around us. With the FlexPath format, you can take classes at your own pace, set your own deadlines, and even leverage your previous experience to move faster. Now that's smart. Learn more at capella.edu. I don't know what most white people in this country feel. I can only include what they feel from the state of their institutions. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. Welcome back to Black History for White People, a podcast where we educate, resource, and challenge white people about black history. I'm Brad, and on today's show are my co-hosts, Katina and Garen. Today, we are wrapping up the final episode in our series on mass incarceration, so we're going to jump right into it. If you haven't listened to the first three parts, make sure you go back and listen to those before this one. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Okay, we are going to wrap up our last episode on mass incarceration. Garen, what do we need to know before heading into that? I think go ahead and let's get into it. So just to review what we've looked at, in the first episode we talked about the heart that we should have towards the imprisoned and towards people who struggle with substance abuse. In the second episode we talked about the history of the war on drugs and how it was started uh, as a deliberate effort to be oppressive and uh, continue the racial caste system. And in the third episode, we talked about how it operates, a little bit about uh, how they incentivize police officers to prosecute the war on drugs. And then in this last episode, we're going to be talking about the war on drugs as a war on the poor. Okay. Prior to the start of the war on drugs, there was this national effort called the War on Poverty, where politicians talked about uh, ending poverty, reducing poverty, helping the poor, and trying to eliminate poverty. But the mentality shifted to where the war on drugs and this new coded language that criminalized the poor, and, and it was it criminalized black people and also just poor people in general, have been criminalized through the war on poverty, or the war on drugs. And so there are many ways in which the system right now is unfair to people who don't have resources. Um, we, we talked a little bit, or we got into that a little bit with the last episode, talking about civil forfeiture and how that is structured in a way that uh, tends to target poor people. But there's a lot more, so we're going to get into that today. Okay. So to start, uh, I'm going to read a quote from Brian Stevenson uh, from EJI, Equal Justice Initiative, that summarizes this well. He says, Our criminal justice system treats you better if you are rich and guilty than if you are poor and innocent. And once you have this in mind and use that as a filter to start paying attention, you will notice this everywhere in every news headline. You once you start paying attention to the number of years of prison sentences that poor defendants who can't afford good lawyers receive for petty, sometimes silly crimes compared to the sentences that wealthy people face or just the way they can use lawyers to slow down. And I mean, so a prime example would be the Sackler family, but it's all throughout our system. People who are wealthy can afford good lawyers and even just having a good lawyer, it becomes this bargaining chip in our legal justice system that you can threaten to slow things down and clog up the system and basically that threat of your power by having a good lawyer can give you the ability to uh, get good plea deals. Um, So our system does not operate in pursuit of justice Our system is designed to operate in a way that benefits the wealthy and the privileged. 
We like to think that in our system you're innocent until proven guilty. And we often say you're innocent until proven guilty. Yep. But the reality is that in our, in our system, if you are poor, you in a literal way, not just exaggerating, you actually are treated as if you're guilty until you're proven that you can afford a lawyer. For poor people, what often happens is they will be charged with a crime. But they're not just charged with a crime. Prosecutors have the power to charge them with any crime that they could have potential probable cause to, to charge them with, even if the crime couldn't be proven in a court and the prosecutor knows it. So profit, prosecutors will do something called like overcharging. They'll load the defendants up with charges and they'll kind of stack them up in order to intimidate the, the defendant and basically say, you, if you're convicted on all these charges, even though the prosecutor knows that's not going to happen, you could get this amount of years in prison. And then the poor defendant who can't afford his own lawyer will have a public defender who just wants to get the case off of his slate because he's got way too many to possibly uh, actually pay attention to all of his cases. And so he, his job is essentially, and he knows this, he's like a cog in the system, his job is not to get innocent people off. His job is to get them the best plea deal that he can. And because he knows he doesn't have the resources to actually fight for people who can't afford lawyers. And so what he will do is he will go to this defendant who likely is innocent and he'll say, hey, you're going to get 40 years if you try to fight this and you're convicted. So I can get you this deal for two years. You say that you're guilty. And so you oftentimes have even innocent people plead guilty. I mean, take the Central Park Five as an example, but the, the, you can multiply these examples through the system. There are many times when an innocent person will plead guilty, particularly if they can get a deal where they are pleading guilty to like a, a lower or a minor offense. Um, they'll plead guilty because it's just a way out of the, the trap of our system that you can't navigate without a lawyer. And just consider the fact that in our system, you basically have no chance to win if you're representing yourself. There's so much technical jargon and legalese and the way things are done are designed to be archaic and complex so that people can't navigate it without a lawyer who's charging them lots of money. And so then people are left in this helpless position where they're pleading guilty to crimes they didn't commit and then they have a criminal record. So then the next time the same thing happens, then it's like they're they're trapped. And with a criminal record, they're legally stripped of many of their rights and discrimination against them becomes legal for the rest of their life. And so it just exacerbates poverty. Right now, there are 470,000 people in America who are locked up in jails who have not been convicted of a crime. And most of them, it's because they can't afford to make bail. And so people who have money pay bail, and they'll get that money back once they show up for court. But the people who are poor, they can't make that bail. And so there's 470,000 people in jail for being poor right now. Those are people that got charged. And haven't been convicted. And haven't been convicted. They're just waiting. Yeah, they just can't afford to make bail to get out during the process of right. fighting for their... Uh, vindication. Wow. And so bail is on average eight months wages for the working poor. In Wisconsin, more than 11,000 poor people go to court without representation each year because anyone who earns more than $3,000 a year is considered able to av- afford their own lawyer. And so they, they don't get a public defender. In Lake Charles, Louisiana, there are two public defenders for 2,500 felony and 4,000 misdemeanor cases every year. Like, how do you think that a public defender is going to provide actual, adequate legal representation to 7,000 cases a year, 10 cases a day? Like, the, you don't even have the time to have 10 conversations a day to negotiate plea deals, much less fight 10 cases, find, collect the evidence, question witnesses. Like, it's right. completely unrealistic. So, it ends up being this pipeline of injustice. The NAACP sued Gulfport, Mississippi for operating, quote, a modern-day debtor's prison by jailing poor people who are unable to pay fines and then denying them the right to lawyers. Wow. 
In 2004, the American Bar Association released a report that concluded that, quote, all too often, defendants plead guilty even if they are innocent without really understanding their legal rights or what is occurring. Sometimes the proceedings reflect little or no recognition that the accused is mentally ill or does not adequately understand English. The fundamental right to a lawyer that Americans assume applies to everyone accused of criminal conduct effectively does not exist in practice for countless people across the United States. Well, and the fact that people are, co are coerced and they think, I mean, I'm sure just the terror of being in jail or being in prison, being locked up, um, people being coerced into thinking that they're going to get out if they do X, Y, Z, just horrible. Mm -hmm. The other thing I didn't mention is that oftentimes for a plea deal, the, the person receiving the deal as a condition of the deal has to report on or kind of be like a whistleblower on other criminal activity, which maybe sometimes works if they actually know about other criminal activity, but they in many cases don't, and it operates as a bribe for them to basically make up accusations against other people. And in many, many cases, like when you start looking at the Innocence Project or other lawyers who work with falsely accused people, so often what you'll find is that there were false witnesses who reported against them, later recanted, and then said that the reason they did it was because the system basically bribed them to do it. And that's exactly what happened in the case of my mother-in-law. There was an informant who basically committed the crime and was coerced into saying that my mother-in-law committed the crime by herself, which, one, she didn't commit the crime, but two, her DNA was not, not found anywhere in the crime scene. Mm -hmm. And three, there's no way she could have physically by herself have killed that man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it reminds me also of the Curtis Flowers case that came before the Supreme Court recently. And if you like true crime shows, uh, In the Dark Season 2 is a really good true crime show about the Curtis Flowers case. But he was on death row, had been tried six times for the same crime. Four times he was tried for, the, for this crime and convicted, and two of the times he was, it was a hung jury. Uh, and in America, if, you're, if you have a not guilty verdict, you can't be tried again for the same crime. But if it's a split jury decision, then you can be tried again. So he just kept getting tried over and over again. And each time, he, the charges would be appealed and overturned because the prosecutor was a mess. He was completely corrupt and we don't have time to get into it, but I wish we did because it would actually feed well into this discussion. But one of the things there is there were three different jailhouse witnesses that were used to convict Curtis Flowers. And all three of them later recanted and said that they had been offered plea deals for other crimes if they would say that they saw Curtis Flowers doing it or that Curtis Flowers had confessed in, in jail that he had done it. All three of them recanted. And then that was like, the cornerstone of how he'd been convicted. But also, even the prosecution witnesses, not the jailhouse ones, but even just the normal people who had been used as witnesses by the prosecution, the In the Dark podcast interviews them, and many of them said that they had been intimidated into testifying, that they actually didn't remember the details well. But the prosecutor came and essentially hinted that I'm going to come after you if you keep this secret and pressured them into testifying. So they ended up giving testimony that actually wasn't accurate, that they didn't even recall because of pressure that was placed on them in the system. And when you start looking at our system and at the stories of people who are vindicated or taken off death row, these are the themes that you see all over the place. Prosecutors have too much power that they misuse. In the Curtis Flowers case, there was uh, multiple of those convictions, the four convictions that I mentioned, were all white juries where every single black juror had been struck off the jury, which actually is an unconstitutional practice. It, it, the Supreme Court in the Batson decision found that it is unconstitutional to strike a juror because of their race. And that was actually part of why the Supreme Court overturned the case. I want to issue this challenge to our listeners because many of you in your lifetime will sit on juries. And if you are on a jury 
where you think as a juror that every black juror, juror was struck down because of their race, like if you think that's the case, that is unconstitutional according to the Batson decision. And that is a reason to issue a not guilty verdict. If, if like, I mean, it's up to you as a juror um, what you want to do, but it is not constitutional and the Supreme Court has overturned uh, decisions, guilty verdicts, because in our, our system you have the legal right to a jury of peers and it is unconstitutional for every black juror to be struck off a jury of a black defendant um, because of their race. So if you're in that situation, look up the, uh, I don't know what you're allowed to look up as a juror, but just know maybe going into it that the Batson decision has found that unconstitutional. And that's like a a huge deal. I think even if we had to make it that big of a deal to like write it into law where this can't happen. Like I wonder why, I think it's just another thing of like systemic racism, like an obvious point of it, of like, you know, we can look at things like there are, you know, the whole bad apples, like they're good prosecutors and then there are really terrible prosecutors. And because of their position, they're, it's like worse than just like a normal, like even lawyer. It's like the prosecutor has so much power in our system. Yeah. So it is worse than like a bad apple lawyer. Yeah. A bad apple prosecutor is like, you know, way worse. But it's like the Batson rule and, and like I would ask myself why... Why are they trying to have an all-white jury? Well, I'll tell you. They have statistics for this. There's a 14% higher chance of a conviction of a black defendant if the jury is all-white. And a lawyer is going to want more chance to win the case. Yeah, so even if it's like, four, I mean, that's 14%. It's pretty, that's a pretty big shift in percentage. But like, even if it was like 4%, they would probably do it. But yeah. I just think like that's just an obvious thing of, um, and we can get mad at prosecutors and we should, and we can get mad at lawyers and we should, but it's like they're just playing the game and the game is the system. And I know we can, there's just like this, it comes back to like, man, how do you fix that? <laughs> how do mm-hmm. you fix the system? System seems, they're just playing the game and they should be, you know, obviously charged for playing the game in a way that is racially charged or biased, but at the same time, it just seems so obvious of like... Their incentives are wrong, so it's yeah. like you can tell them you're not supposed to do this, but until you fix the system... Right. Then, yeah. So the... the and, and I think that people who go along with a, a guilty system, like the Nazis who committed horrible crimes when they were in a system that kind of forced them to, there's like that question of like... To what degree are they complicit? And I think we like the general conclusion is there's still complicity. Like if you are complicit in a bad system and going along with it and hurting people, like you are guilty for that. Like that is wrong. You are complicit in that. But as we look to solutions and to changing the system, I think it's unrealistic to expect an, a, just a moral awakening that happens where we have a bad system that suddenly goes from not working to working because people just like grow a conscience. I think to actually fix the system is going to require that we think about the incentives that people have and how they're messed up right now and rewire the system to actually get the results we want. Um, so yeah, I think... Or infuse it with people in those positions that love people and don't love power. Mm -hmm. Well, and have a a strong system of accountability. When you look at district attorneys and prosecutors historically, especially considering periods of enslavement, Jim Crow, which just ended in the 60s, and then discrimination that has continued, you see the complicity towards the the, uh, leaning towards racism, where people don't want necessarily the truth or justice, they want to win a case. Mm -hmm. They want to, you know, not only win a case, but they want to take care of their buddies. In the case of um, Ahmaud Arbery, the former DA who was finally, I mean, because he went, uh, Ahmaud's murder went, was it 72 days before the men who who lynched him were arrested? Mm -hmm. 
And the dad, he was friends with the DA. He was an investigator, correct? With that, um, the DA who ended up going to jail. But it was only the public outcry that even turned the tide on this. Mm -hmm. The fact that there has to be protest to get the justice system to do what it should have been doing. So it was only the public outcry that even the, it was the only the yeah it was only the public outcry they even got got the attention needed to put them in in jail and which then you know after that there's a case but that the, they were going to get away with it mm-hmm. or I think it was going to be off the radar and there was going to be nothing yeah another example is in the case I mentioned earlier with Curtis Flowers the prosecutor Doug Evans was. Uh, he was coercing witnesses, blackmailing witnesses. He yeah. was distorting justice, falsifying evidence. He doesn't face any consequences for any of that. Like prosecutors... That's unbelievable. I mean, there's people that get caught with an ounce of weed that are in prison now for... For 40 yeah. years. For, yeah. 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 And th- that, I mean... And then you can... I, I don't know how you look at that and not get enraged at that. Well, yeah. and just like the uh, the prosecutor who... In, in my mother-in-law's case, the, the informants, they recanted their story. They wrote letters advocating for her innocence. And this DA has proven to be corrupt and has several cases where he was proven to be corrupt, has a, a complete smear on his entire career as, as, as a prosecutor, and they haven't reopened. They, they still haven't reopened his cases. Mm-hmm. So people have just suffered. And then they find out that they're corrupt or it comes out that they're corrupt because they know that they are and there's nothing. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let's move on to just talking new angles of this that we haven't even brought in yet. Yeah. Re- well, right before we do that, I found it interesting in the Maude Arbery case that there was a poll done back in last spring, so spring of 2020 after it happened. Mm-hmm. They polled like different groups of people like, hey, was this... Was this uh, like a vigilante kind of killing. They were wrong, but they were more or less just like vigilantes. Or was it like racially charged kind of thing? And the 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 least, so white evangelicals and I think white Catholics were the l- most likely to say it was a vigilante mm-hmm. kind of killing. They were wrong, but, you know, they were vigilante. And then they were the least likely, white evangelicals and white Catholics were the least likely to say that it was racially like it was that it was a racially charged murder which is really interesting because in the person that I saw kind of show this information just said that it's that white evangelicals and white catholics would be the would be the most to deny that something is racist yeah like racially charged so it's just interesting that you know i think if you're a white evangelical or you're a white catholic you're the most prone to say that it's not and I think it's just good to, the whole implicit bias thing, like I think you just have to keep that in your head and, and you're going to be, just like I am, going to be bent towards that and that's not okay. And it's like now we, it went through the law in a broken system and they got charged big time and it was like very obvious, like the things that they were saying during it and stuff were Awful. Extremely. Well, and the fact that they, the, the last words that Ahmad heard before he was, lynched was he was called an effing n-word mm-hmm. how could that not be racially motivated and there are still people who are like let's leave race out of it no let's not because they didn't and if that were a white man that were jogging in the neighborhood he would still be alive today mm-hmm. so let's step back from this and bring in even some more angles um, on the, this whole conversation that we haven't brought in yet and then we can kind of finish building out the picture and then land the plane. Um, so the poverty trap, the trap of poverty, begins before somebody is first charged with a crime, um, all the way back uh, in the school system. Many offenders are tracked for prison at early ages, labeled as criminals in their teen years, and then shuttled from their decrepit, underfunded inner city schools to brand new high-tech prisons. It's like we funnel all this money into these prison systems that cost, you know, depending on the prison, between like $45,000 or $80,000 a year per person. And yet we can't fund these schools 
to actually give people like a future. And the, I mean, we can. It's not that we can't. It's that we don't. That our, we choose to put our money. That biblical verse about it, where your money is, there your heart will be also. And our money is in criminalization. Yeah, and we and we talked about in an earlier episode of all that money. It shifted. Yeah. In the '60s, right? In, yeah, in the '80s, when, or in the '80s when all that money went more towards enforcement mm-hmm. and actually took from, that pulled away from the system, the the resources that were actually trying to help people. Right. So, a task force for the American Bar Association described the bleak reality facing a petty drug offender this way: "Quote: The offender may be sentenced to a term of probation, community service, and court costs." Unbeknownst to this offender and perhaps to any other actor in the sentencing process, as a result of his conviction, he may be ineligible for many federally funded health and welfare benefits, food stamps, public housing, and federal education assistance. His driver's license may be automatically suspended. He may no longer qualify for certain employment and professional licenses. If he is convicted of another crime, he may be subject to imprisonment as a repeat offender. He will not be permitted to enlist in the military or possess a firearm or obtain federal security clearance. As a citizen, he may lose the right to vote. If not a citizen, he becomes immediately deportable. So our system punishes people in the way that we are aware of. Like the top of the iceberg is a low-level offender might get a year, uh, might get less, might get more. But then there are all these other consequences that take these marginalized populations that don't have the right to or the access to legal representation that we have as you know middle class people and then strips them further of all of these rights that they aren't even aware of or informed of the ways that this is going to affect them. And then throughout the U.S., newly released prisoners are required to make payments to a host of agencies, including probation departments, courts, child support enforcement offices. In some jurisdictions, ex-offenders are billed for drug testing and even for the drug treatment that they're supposed to receive as a condition of parole. These fees, costs, and fines are generally new. They're introduced into the system in the last 20 years, and they are associated with a wide range of offenses. Every state has its own rules and regulations that govern this. Florida, for example has added more than 20 new categories of financial obligations for criminal defendants defendants since 1996, while eliminating most exemptions for those who cannot pay. And these fines become a trap. They take poor people and make them even more poor. A former inmate living at or below the poverty level can be charged by four or five departments at once and be required to surrender 100% of his or her wages, having them garnished. As a New York Times editorial soberly observed, quote, people caught in this impossible predicament are less likely to seek regular employment, making them even more susceptible to criminal relapse. Like, what incentive do you have as a released convict to re-enter into a society where you are essentially forced to be in this, like, living debtor's prison? Debtor's pr- prison is illegal, Yet probation and parole are often used as a threat to collect debt. Some people literally choose jail as a way to reduce impossible debt burdens that they can't service. And many states suspend driver's licenses as a penalty for failure to make debt payments, which causes poor people to lose access to their way to actually get to jobs. And it gives them another way to get back into the system Mm -hmm. for driving without a license. And just to show the scope of some of this, like when we're talking about innocent people being swept into the system, that there's multiple kinds of, there's like shades of innocence. There are people who just literally didn't do the crime that they accused of. And there are literally, just to show the scope of the problem, tens of thousands of people like that. Projects like the Innocence Project or other projects that provide appeals for people who have been convicted of crimes. As we continue to get a pulse of how many innocent people are in the system, or if you look at just the number of people in the system who continue to maintain their innocence throughout their whole process, I think it's fair to estimate that there are at 
minimum tens of thousands, if not uh, you know a hundred thousand or more people in the system who just didn't commit the, the crime that they're accused of. But then in addition to that, then there's also, we've talked about just many drug crimes that shouldn't even be a crime, right. like shouldn't even be a crime at all. Right. So those people might not be technically innocent according to the charges, but they've done something that is it should be dealt with in the mental health care system and shouldn't be criminalized. Um, so then when you add that in, then you're dealing with hundreds of thousands or millions of people in the system who shouldn't be there. And and over the course of this series, I don't want to, and we I don't think we, I think we've spoken to this, but I just want to reiterate, we are not opposed to sentences for violent criminals. The push against mass incarceration is not a push to reduce all consequences for crimes. The problem it, like I think people who are um, you know sociopaths and psychopaths and committing repeat offenses like serial killers, serial rapists, serial, like you want those people to be locked up because on the outside they are going to continue to commit crimes and harm people. Like we're not talking about. Not I think I think what we've I think what we've done is we're we're like maximizing the penalty for these low-level offenses just across the board, and we're minimizing the super serious offenses for their crime. And so that's why you see these people that are like funneling billions of dollars or funneling tons of drugs and just like basically creating an opioid system get no, almost no punishment, no prison years. Doesn't Their, their actual punishment is so reduced and then someone who is on the street caught with some drugs that is like maximum penalty from our law to them. And so it's almost like we need to flip it. We need to, the, the more severe the crime, the more severe the punishment. And we've kind of like f- inverted that scale to where like small punishment or small crimes get severe punishment. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? And big crimes get little punishment. Yeah. Yeah, and we're yeah, we're not saying that there shouldn't be a criminal justice system and that violent criminals or criminals there's there are types of crime that harm other people and those crimes should be prosecuted and dealt with and people should go to prison for long terms for violent crime. But we are talking about these petty offenses that are overcriminalized in order to propagate this system of injustice and that 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 system needs to be reworked and that most people who interact with our criminal justice system are not violent criminals. It's actually a small minority. They're a big portion of the people in prison because like murderers go to prison for a longer time. So they will end up being a bigger representation of who's actually in prison is um, like roughly half violent criminals. Uh, but if you actually look at the number of people who interact with our system, most of those who interact with it are not violent criminals. And let's get rid of the death penalty. The death penalty yeah. is it's a descendant of lynching. It's yeah, literally, absolutely. when you look at the, the number of death penalties carried out each year and the states that carried them out, it literally grew out of the lynching system. Yeah, that, we should do an episode on that at some point. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah, and in, in southern states, they were trying to convince their own populace to stop lynching people because it was looking bad for them, and so they started doing these kind of mock show trials and death penalty convictions that happened really quick, and it was almost universally early on. It was almost universally uh, all white juries convicting black defendants and quick death penalty convictions. Yeah, like quick as in like, oh, we do this, we do, we put on the trial, so it looks like. You know, they actually did it. And mm-hmm. then the jury meets for literally a few minutes. Yes, a few minutes, conviction, and then they kill them a couple of days later. Yeah. And it was, it was a way to basically try to bring the lynchings that were already happening into the system. So it was not right. designed in pursuit of justice. It was literally designed to try to, it was like lynching light is what it was. And we're still, we're doing that today. There are parts of the country that are killing people. Mm-hmm. And like, knowing st- that the states are killing yeah. people. Like Julius Jones, um, thankfully his sentence was commuted, um, but he was in prison for a crime that he did not commit. And knowing that there is bias 
implicit bias and racism and oppression that hasn't been addressed in our justice system, we have to know that we are executing innocent people. There's a there there's probably a significant percentage even today of specifically black and brown people and even other people who have not committed the crimes that they've been accused of because the justice system is so so dicey. Yeah. And I think even EJI has a thing where what one in nine people on death row are innocent are shown to be innocent. They're and that's sh- just like, the ones that we can prove they're those innocent. Those are proven to be. So that's a what eleven percent failure. Failure, and I think even Brian Stevenson um, even relates that to like if our planes, like if a pilot, fly, if our planes had an eleven percent failure rate, no one would fly a plane. Mm-hmm. Right. But we're using that in our criminal justice system, mm-hmm. like as if oh, it's okay. Yeah. Like we would never approve we, of an 11% fail rate on anything. But it's it, it's swept under the rug. It's, it's not perfect, but it's like not perfect, but these are human lives, but not perfect, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then there are people who are still walking around having lynched people, having committed crimes. Yeah, they may be 80 and 90 years old, having been complicit in the murder of children, Emmett Till's murderer. Acu- you know, the woman who accused Emmett Till, who should be brought to justice and have not been. There was a period after the 60s, segregation ended, where many of those who had murdered black people, lynched black people, they went free. Medgar Evers' murderer. It took Medgar's wife years and years and years to get that man behind bars, and he was openly bragging about having murdered Medgar. But there are, again, black people who are in prison from the, still from the war on drugs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And <clears throat> getting into like what we've been talking about, just like the way it's flipped, uh, this quote kind of captures that well. So a quote from New Jim Crow says, In 1982, SCOTUS upheld, or the Supreme Court, um, upheld 40 years of imprisonment for possession of an attempt to sell nine ounces of marijuana. 40 years. An attempt. <clears throat> An attempt. The Supreme Court found that the sentence was, quote, reasonably proportionate to the offense committed and not cruel or unusual, which would violate the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution. This ruling was remarkable given that prior to the Drug Inf- Reform Act, the longest sentence Congress had ever imposed for possession of any drug in any amount was one year. Any drug, any amount for possession. Was was one year. One year. Unbelievable. Yeah, and then in the wake of the war on drugs, this mentality shifted. And also, just bear in mind that in other countries, other developed nations, that's what's the norm, is like a year for first-time drug offenses is like a max. Probably no, no jail at all. A life sentence for first-time drug offense is unheard of in the rest of the developed world. A conviction for selling a kilo of heroin yields a mandatory 10-year sentence in the U.S. compared to six months in England. And I mean, England, they have their own struggles and issues with <clears throat> with racism, but yeah. it hasn't manifested in the same way there but through the criminal justice system. And all of this is a terrible weight that falls onto many judges. Like the way that mandatory minimum sentences operates... Uh, let, let me just like give the judge's perspective real quick on a lot of this. Um, judge Lawrence Irving, a Reagan appointee, noted upon his retire- retirement, quote, if I remain on the bench, I have no choice but to follow the law, and I just can't in good conscience continue to do this. Judge Jack Weinstein publicly refused to take any more drug cases, describing, quote, a sense of depression about much of the cruelty I have been party to in connection with the war on drugs. Another Reagan appointee, Judge Stanley Marshall, told a reporter, quote, I've always been considered a fairly harsh sentencer, but it's killing me, and I'm sending so many low-level offenders away for all this time. U.S. District Judge William Schwarzer, a Republican appointee, is not known as a light sensor, and so everyone in his San Francisco courtroom watched in stunned silence as Schwarzer, known for his stoic demeanor, choked with tears as he anguished over sentencing Richard Anderson, a first-time offender, Oakland longshoreman, to 10 years in prison without parole for what appeared to be a minor mistake in judgment and having given a ride to a drug dealer 
for a meeting with an undercover agent. Wow. The late Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy said, quote, our prison resources are misspent, our punishments too severe, our sentences too loaded. I can accept neither the necessity nor the wisdom of federal mandatory minimum sentences. In all too many cases, mandatory minimum sentences are unjust. And yet the politicians haven't taken them away and we continue in that system. And we think that, I think there's like a collective, you know, it doesn't affect us because we're not in jail and we don't see those people. We've, we've talked about that, like prisons and jails are, I mean, even physically, they're out located. Sight, out of mind. They're just not close to people. So, I mean, most people probably have no idea where the nearest prison is in their city. And I think most people think this doesn't affect us, but it even economically affects us. Like we could be doing better just purely, even if you don't love people, let's say you just love money. Well, you could be getting, like our, our country as a whole could be doing better if this wasn't true. And that's our next episode is going to, I guess that's a little Easter egg for the next episode that we're going to do is on the cost of racism. Yeah, I mean, just it's from a literally financial... costing our country trillions of dollars, and we'll get into that. Yeah. And it's, do- I mean, who knows what it's doing to us emotionally, psychologically, sociologically. I mean, it's messing us up, and we're, be- we're becoming less and less loving of people. Mm-hmm. Which in some ways, well, I would say in, in a lot of ways to most people, that's worse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, systems of oppression, they hurt the oppressed as well as the perpetrators. Mm-hmm. They, they hurt both. And they hurt the descendants of both. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's created a callousness that is centered around oppression, but given different languages, language um, as if it isn't that. Oh, it's just, you know, American, uh, American patriotism. It's pulling yourself up by the boot, bootstraps, all rooted in racism, but it allows people to distance themselves from racism by having, you know, reconstructed language that still is racism that benefits no one. I mean, the horror and the terrorism and the genocide of racism, having, think about even just having um, people in your family. I, I've been looking in my family tree because I had to find my great, great, great grandfather who was enslaved. He was born in 1853. His daughter is my great, great grandmother who helped raise me. And she used to tell me that her father was enslaved and that she didn't even know her birth year. I, I just found out last night that her birth year. It, it, and that was very common for enslaved people to not know their birth year or their age. I found out she was two years older than she thought she was. But anyway, think about having someone in your family that, because I have people in my family who were enslaved. Think about having murderers, rapists, people who lynch people, just all these heinous crimes in your family line. Think about your great-great-grandfather being an enslaver and raping. I mean, and, and that person who should have been in prison, like let's talk about who really should have been in prison, who should have been in prison, who should have been brought to justice, help raise your grandmother, help raise your mom. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And how those influences of people who perform acts of terror, their influence over your mind and your everyday dealings and why you do some of the things you do and why to think why you think some of the things you think. I mean, when you look at people who are very callous and, un- and not compassionate towards the oppressed, you don't have to look much further than their own lineage mm-hmm. to see the language of... It, I'm, we're talking about people whose grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents cut off people's body parts as relics participated in lynchings, participated in charring black bodies, riddling them with bullets, uh, raping black girls and women, that has an impact on the generations. Mm -hmm. It's just a natural thing, especially someone that's not, not brought to justice. There would be white people that would go to jail for murder, murder of white people, but not for the murder of black people. 
they would sit in the courtroom and shake hands and pat each other on the back when they wouldn't go to prison like they should. That has an impact. Again, Ahmad Arbery, there is a father and a son that were convicted, a father and a son. What is that going to do to their bloodline? What does that do to their family? That, that destroyed a family. But it, wasn't, it didn't start with the two of them. Mm -hmm. I bet that father's father mm -hmm. and that father's father's father and, or mother, they had an influence in, in what shaped them to think that they could carry out uh, a lynching, mm -hmm. a public lynching of a black man. Yeah, I think there's, there's not a good way to even take an account of the toll that like the moral loss of racism has cost us. It's yeah, but it is, I'm sure, unfathomable. Yeah, like when you start to think of all the ways in which, <clears throat> like, men who would perform these lynchings or do the Tulsa massacre, like, how many of them, like, struggled with alcoholism after that and their bodies' ways of coping with what they did or just became callous and then struggled with, like, you know, how, how did that affect their fathering of their children, their ability to have, like, connection and intimacy? Like, and then even just the moral dimension of, like, the, the, the biblical description of sin is that it blinds us. Like, it actually takes away and numbs our senses yeah. to spiritual things, to reality. The Bible describes in two different psalms, it'll talk about idols, how idols, they, they had like little stone statues that they would worship back in that context. And, and the, it'll say in the psalms that these idols have eyes and don't see and ears and don't hear and they have mouths, but they can't speak. And those who worship them will become like them. So the accusation is if you worship these false idols, you are going to be less able to speak, less able to see, less able to hear, like your senses will be numbed. And I think that there is a spiritual blindness that is a legacy of all the past atrocities that were never dealt with. Yeah. Like a spiritual insensitivity and a lack of compassion that stems from, uh, like in the white community, uh, from just unrepented garbage filling our history that we've never dealt with. That I mean, Brian Stevenson, I love his wording that it haunts us. And I feel that haunting. And when you start to actually look at this history and understand it, and then you start to look at this conversation around people trying to prevent true history from being taught exactly. in our public schools, like you can see just another generation passing this baton of a lack of compassion, a lack of honesty, a lack of really dealing with like the sin that got us here. It's the children of the enslaver that don't want the true history to come forward because they've built this system around being patriotic and love of country. And love of country has come at the expense, at the infliction of black bodies. Yeah. And so we have to believe if there are, there are survivors right now of the Tulsa race massacre, there are victims, the survive, people who were there present and watched their families killed in front of them. They were children. There are also survivors of the perpetrators. There are survivors of those who committed the crimes, the heinous acts. Yeah. And those are those survivors' children, you know, those people's children. They've inherited the jewelry that was stolen. They've the inherited things. everything, but also they've inherited the legacy of racism mm. and not wanting the stories to be told. Mm. It doesn't just start, no one just, it doesn't just start at a dinner table. Like the people who are at the dinner tables, the people who are at the dinner tables who are racist mm. and saying racist things in front of their family, like we're, 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 we're in the middle of Thanksgiving weekend and people are like, oh, I got to go and sit across from my racist parents or my racist grandparents. That didn't start there. It started with a long legacy mm -hmm. of, 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 of generations of hatred yeah. and terrorism. And I would argue those people, you know, we talk about love of country. I'm, I'm not going to argue that they don't love the country. I would just argue that it's a shallower love. Mm -hmm. Like it's not actually real love. 
I think, you know, we have, we love tacos and we love our family. Like you obviously don't love tacos the same as your family. So I think those people do love maybe our country, but they're, that love is not deep. It's, you can't love something unless you know. It's an idol worship. It literally is an idol worship. You can't, if we're going to deal with the word love, like the word love should be uh, the definition of the word love. You can't love your country, you can't love anyone and hate other people and and condone the horrible, horrific, you know, activity that has been done. Like you can't, Mm -hmm. you can't, you can't love anything or anyone if you're okay with this legacy of hatred. Yeah. I mean, like black people and native Americans are part of this country. So if you don't love them, you're not really loving the country. Just like if I said, like, I love your family so much, except for I hate one of your children. Right. <laughs> like, right. Then how, you know, that's an artificial love. So let, let's come back to all of this, but just to kind of lay in the plane here, um, just want to focus in on a little bit more, just the racial disparities that happen as a result of our criminal justice system and give a few examples of that. Um, So in 15 states, black people are admitted to prisons on drug drug charges. In 15 states, black people are admitted to prison on drug charges at a rate of 20 to 57 times higher than white men. And people of all races use and sell drugs at remarkably similar rates. If there are significant differences in the surveys to be found, they're frequently suggesting that white people particularly white youths, are likely to engage in illegal drug dealing at a higher level, particularly for drugs that are more expensive because white people are at schools where the kids just have more income and buy more expensive drugs. So one example published in 2000 by the National Institute of Drug Abuse reported that white students use cocaine at seven times the rate of black students, use crack cocaine at eight times the rate of black students, and use heroin at seven times the rate of black students, which is... Not the picture that you get from the drug war as it's prosecuted. But police aren't going into prep schools and policing no, they these are not. prep kids selling their extra income that they grab from mom and dad to buy drugs to party with and experiment with at the lake house. Like that's not where the resources are spent. And so that's not what we have in our mental picture. But then the the system, anytime a black person does use or sell drugs, it's like they're far more likely to be caught because they're the ones being policed. And so the system, at, at each level, there's this compounding effect that happens. Like if you're familiar with interest rates and how interest rates compound over time, it's a similar thing where there's this compounding effect that happens where black people are more likely to be pulled over by the police more likely to be, if pulled over, they're three times more likely to have their car searched. If their car is searched and drugs are found, they're more likely to be charged with it and not just given a warning or not, you know, the whole white privilege thing of like, okay, I'm going to take you home and tell your parents and then not press charges. It's going to work outside the system. If they are charged, they're more likely for the prosecutor to load them up with more charges. They're given more charges on average. They're less likely to afford a private attorney who's going to get them a better deal. So then they're more likely to get longer sentences or to be convicted. And then they're more likely, if they come before a jury, to face an all-white jury that is more likely to convict them. And then they are sentenced more harshly. So you end up with this compounding effect where at layer after layer of the, the, this layer cake, that each layer there's more injustice added to where the final result at the end of the picture is like a, a six-fold or more difference in uh, this growing chasm of racial disparity and how black people experience the criminal justice system. So getting into some of the statistics to back all this up, in Volusia County, Florida, a report obtained 148 hours of video footage documenting more than 1,000 highway stops conducted by state troopers Only 5% of the drivers on the road were African-American or Latino. It's a very white community. But more than 80% of the people stopped and searched were minorities. Yeah, again, another disparity that's like, I think there's always going to be disparities uh, in anything regardless, but you're looking at like plus or minus. That's it. 
you know, one, two, three. This is a chasm. And maybe you would say, I mean, you have to either say, again, we're going to come back to this always, <laughs> or at least I am. You either have to say something is wrong with the system there of why, or people, like there's something wrong there. And it's either on the system side or you are just racist in your thinking that black people can't drive as good as white people. Right. Which, again, is not true. <laughs> is racially charged. It's like r- racially biased. And it's wrong. And I just don't, like you have to, that's what you have to think on this situation. That disparity is massive. Mm-hmm. And it's borne out in other places in the system. In Illinois, Latinos are 8% of the population and less than 3% of personal vehicle trips because they tend to drive less or shorter distances. Yet they're 30% of motorist stops, despite being less likely than white people to have contraband in their vehicles. In Oakland, California, a 2001 study found that blacks were twice as likely as whites to be stopped and three times more likely to have their vehicles searched. And you know the the examples like you can just find if you do some searching on the internet, you can find example after example of this being borne out in study after study. Some states allow children to be prosecuted as adults at ages of ten, twelve, or thirteen years old. Wow! Children as young as eight have been prosecuted as adult as adults. There's one story Brian Stevenson talks about where he was defending a child who was being prosecuted. The prosecution was moving to charge him as an adult. And he did a motion in response saying that he wanted, instead of this child being prosecuted as an adult, he wanted to motion that he be tried as a wealthy white executive, like elder statesman or something like that. Mm. It, it, making the point that like it's just this make-believe fiction. Like you're pretending, you, you basically are wanting to pretend like he's an adult when he's not. Mm-hmm. But then, what we we don't get to pretend like he's like anything else. But it's just this slanted thing where these children, as young as eight, being tried as an adult, and black children are six times more likely to be sentenced as adults. So it's being disproportionately used on black kids. Some four thousand five hundred children are housed in adult jails and prisons on any given day in America, and facing the abuse that comes with those systems on children who we fail to protect. This is a moral abomination that our country is doing this and allowing this. And it's rooted in racism and in this idea of like black boys, once they reach puberty, they're just seen as like, just criminalized and just seen as like old, scary, you know, they're seen as older than they are, scarier, stronger and feared. And then that, is used to justify like treating them like they're adults when they're not. They're just kids and they're like if they have a big athletic body that does not make them an adult. And yet that's what our system does. And children are housed uh, children who are housed in adult jails and prisons are nine times more likely to commit suicide versus juvenile facilities. Yeah. Because of what they face. On a similar note, many of these children then, they, they, it's not legal to convict children of uh, the death penalty, but there's this other, like, the, I mean, EJI calls it death in prison sentences because mm-hmm. it's this life in prison without parole. This idea, you're going to die in prison. And EJI said of these sentences, quote, most of these sentences were mandatory. The sentencing judge was not allowed to consider the child's age or life history. Some children were sentenced for crimes where no one was killed or even injured and many were convicted even though older teens or adults were primarily responsible for their crimes. 70% of those 14 or younger who were sentenced to die in prison were children of color. There's this thing in our system where if you're committing a felony and somebody else kills someone while you're committing a felony, then it's felony murder and it's treated as if you committed the murder even though you didn't and so there's these children who are just basically along with older people who are committing these crimes who are then tried as an adult and then convicted of felony murder and sentenced to die in prison for basically just having a bad influence pull them into something and they didn't really even do anything Wow. so we need to look for a better way forward our system is broken it is not working the way that we think that it's working it is destroying lives 
harming children, and it's even counterproductive. It's it's not reducing crime. We've, we've talked about how we've passed the point of the over criminalization of people is probably actually leading to more criminal activity as people have their hope and future stripped away from them and are released from prisons without the ability to get a job and without the incentives to get a job because wages are garnished to pay fines and fees. Like we have a broken system, so let's reflect on the way forward. First, we just have to admit that there currently is not a desire or a movement to really change things. There's relatively little organized opposition to the drug war. Most people don't really see it as a problem because if you're not in it, if you're not in the system, then you don't really see it. It's out of sight, out of mind. Any dramatic effort to scale back the war on drugs is quickly condemned as soft on crime. So here from Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow, the fate of millions of people Indeed, the future of the black community itself may depend on the willingness of those who care about racial justice to re-examine their basic assumptions about the role of the criminal justice system in our society. The fact that more than half of the young black men in many large American cities are currently under the control of the system is not, as many argue, just a symptom of poverty or poor choices, but rather evidence of a new racial caste system at work. So we need to change the system, and part of that means we need to invest in people. Research conducted by the the Corporation for Supportive Housing in New York State shows that the use of state prisons and city jails dropped by 74% and 40% respectively when people with past criminal records were provided with supportive housing. Just providing them with housing upon getting out of jail reduced recidivism, like returning to jail, by 74%. And it's like the cost of that, like if you're, you're going to have, have to house them in jail is the alternative, and that's even more expensive. It's like the cost of that is nothing compared to the cost that we pay to imprison people. We need to end the war on drugs. We should legalize marijuana and retroactively pardon those who are in prison for possession of marijuana and other drugs. We should tax marijuana and use it for social programs that help former prisoners and victims of the drug war to reintegrate into society. And we should use public health lenses for drugs and drug abuse rather than a criminal lens. Doing this would also, uh, we mentioned before, that would defund the cartels. Like The cartels get a significant portion of their money from the war on drugs and from marijuana and from the way the war on drugs props up drug prices and the whole system as it exists now. So that would do a lot to even stabilize Mexico and other South and Central American nations. Um, We should end civil forfeiture. Police should not have an incentive to for injustice. We should create a presumption of innocence in cases of civil forfeiture, uh, I guess we wouldn't need to do that if we ended it, but <laughs> in short of ending it, there should be a presumption of innocence rather than the current system, which is you're kind of guilty until proven innocent. Uh, we should provide ca- legal counsel to the poor and forfeited assets should not go to police departments so that they don't have that perverse incentive. We should also restore the rights of those with criminal records, especially nonviolent offenders. And uh, those posthumously as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. The felony record checkbox should go away in employment. People should not be allowed to legally discriminate against someone because of a felony record that they have you know, done their time for, particularly if it's not relevant to the job. Like a nonviolent drug offense is not relevant to most occupations and it shouldn't be legal to discriminate against someone because of that. Felons should be allowed to vote so that politicians do not have a political incentive to maintain large prison populations in their districts. There are some rural districts where there are huge prisons that are counted in the census towards the political power of that representative or state legislator, and none of those prisoners are allowed to vote. I think it's crazy. I don't know if people really understand what you just said, and I can relate it to the three-fifths compromise which I think in school we've been taught maybe people remember it different. It's not like enslaved people were three-fifths of a vote and they got to actually vote, but it didn't no. count as a That's not actually what happened. What happened was 
enslaved people could not vote, okay? So let's just like relate that to people in prison with, with these sentencing. They cannot vote either, okay? But then in the three-fifths compromise, the population of enslaved people, like just their body counts, were added to cities where they were used in to add to political power. Mm-hmm. So, they got more representatives in the South as a re- in the House of Representatives as a result of this population that was not allowed to vote. Right. right. So same thing in in prison right now. They those people cannot vote. And what Garen just said, and there's cities where there's huge populations that benefit them politically, but have zero benefit to the actual human being. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's cra- that is crazy. Yeah, they'll they'll be representatives in the House of Representatives or in state legislatures who large shares of their districts are imprisoned people who they have no incentive to care about at all. They, they have the incentive to grow the prison population right. because as a non-voting population, it actually increases their power, but they don't have an incentive to, to win love those people to care for them. No yeah. incentive to love people. That's crazy. Right. And so while the three-fifths, black people being three-fifths of a person that contributed to that state's electoral college, freedmen and women were considered at, well, freedmen were considered one full person, but still weren't able to vote. I just had to throw that in there. Yeah, that's yeah. even Just crazier. this exploitation of black bodies. Mm-hmm. And we're still doing that. Yes. Yep. It continues to today. So may you, listener, be an active part of shedding light on this dark system. It's broken. And we can't all, like most of us don't have the power to just flip a switch and make it better, but we can be on the right side of shedding light on the brokenness that is out there and stirring up the moral conscience of our nation to someday right these great wrongs. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you're looking for more information on what we discussed, take a look at the show notes or go to blackhistoryforwhitepeople.com. As always, you can support us on Patreon for $5 a month at patreon.com backslash blackhistoryforwhitepeople. On our next episode, we're going to be discussing cultural appropriation. We'll leave you with this quote from Barbara C. Jordan. What the people want is simple. They want an America as good as its promise. National Geographic's Welcome to Earth, starring Will Smith, is a new six-part original series coming to Disney Plus December 8th. Smith embarks on a -a once-in-a-lifetime adventure across the globe alongside some of the world's top explorers. Take a ride through Earth's mind-bending portals and observe the strangest, most unusual spectacles the planet has to offer, some captured for the first time ever. You've never seen the world like this. National Geographic's Welcome to Earth. All episodes streaming December 8th, only on Disney Plus. At Capella University, education is as smart as the world around us. With the FlexPath format, you can take classes at your own pace, set your own deadlines, and even leverage your previous experience to move faster. Now that's smart. Learn more at capella.edu.